Hi, and welcome to another Retronaut video. You can probably tell what we're going to be looking at here today. I'm actually introducing three new machines to the channel, and I'm going to give you, hopefully, a brief introduction to all three. You'll have to forgive me if I actually skip some points because I can't go into every single detail, as you can imagine. That would be a little bit too much. I do hope in the future to go into uh, in-depth videos on each one of these machines. So um, hopefully that will come uh, to happen. But for now, I'm going to try and keep this to an overview. So I've actually had these uh, three machines for uh, about four years at this point. During COVID, I was watching, like a lot of people, I think, uh, the 8-Bit Guy and Adrian's Digital Basement. And I actually first encountered the Apple II. I was actually thinking about, as I you know, carried on watching these videos, uh, getting myself a retro machine. I didn't actually have any at that point. And um, I began to think, you know, which machine was I going to get? Back in the day, if you watched my history uh, series, you'll know that I had a number of machines, Commodore 64, Dragon 32, various Amigas. And I was thinking to myself, do I want to get myself one of those machines? And my first impetus was to do that. But then I thought to myself, well, actually, wouldn't it be more interesting to get a machine which I didn't actually have when I was younger? And my thinking on that was that it would be interesting to experience a new device, something that was well regarded. And uh, I actually think that actually wasn't a bad decision looking back. So another reason why I wanted to own an Apple II specifically is that back in the 1980s, I used to buy games for my Commodore 64. Now, originally, those were on tape. And at that point, I had absolutely no inkling whatsoever that the Apple II existed. But as soon as I got a disk drive, I received a, a number of games that when I bought the disk drive. That's a story for another time. I got 10 games. I was very lucky. And in those games, there were games which had a very particular style to them. And I looked at the box art, and I could see that uh, there was a very similar sort of style to the graphics. And I sort of into it from that that these were actually developed on a different machine, not on the actual Commodore 64 first. This was confirmed, I think, by the fact that when you read the back of the box, very often it would say um, available for Apple II as well. Um, very often there were other machines, but the common denominator was the Apple II. So I'm talking about games like The Bard's Tale, Task Times in Tone Town. Yeah, try saying that one. Or Pinball Construction Set. But there were a number of other games I actually encountered that had this very particular graphical style, and I'll try and show that to you on screen now. So yeah, that was interesting. There was another machine out there that seemed to have been around before the Commodore 64 and for which there were a number of games. So at this point, I felt that I had an opportunity to see a whole different continuum of computing, something which I hadn't actually experienced back in the 80s whatsoever. So on the table today, what I've actually got is three different iterations of the Apple II computer, which I ended up buying. And um, these all came along in something of, the, of a flurry in the early spring and summer of 2020. And like I said, this was during uh, COVID. In the middle, we've got an Apple IIe. This was um, a machine, I think, that was released in about 1983. And I bought this in March of 2020. And this is actually several iterations on, or I think it's three iterations on from the original Apple II. Uh, but it shares about 97% of its DNA with it. And what it is actually is a sort of combination of various features which were pioneered in the earlier machines and which were then included in the Apple IIe. And I was very happy to get this because, and I did a bit of research and I was told, and I think it was good advice, that this was a really good machine to get because it didn't have some of the sort of more annoying foibles of the early machines. So yeah, I was really happy that this was actually my first Apple II. To the right of it, is my Apple IIc. And I think this is a beautiful machine. And I actually bought this uh, in June of the same year. And I didn't originally know about this, uh, but I was actually looking for uh, an Apple IIe to buy. And then I saw this little fella. And I just had to get it because I just thought it was an absolutely classic in terms of its design. It actually features a design language called Snow White. And this was something that actually uh, came about later in the life of the Apple II. And it was around the time that Apple were actually making a change in the design of the Macintosh. 
And uh, I believe it was the first machine where it was actually pioneered on. And uh, I think it's a beautiful looker. Um, I think it's a fantastic machine. It's not, in my opinion, maybe the best Apple II to get, unless you want to obviously get more than, more than one than I, like I did, because it does actually have less expandability than this one. But as I said, I was looking for this. I saw this actually come up on the market. And as soon as I saw this, I got the funds together and I snapped it up. And the reason for that is that Apple IIs are actually not that common in the UK. They weren't really a big thing over here. And I'll talk about that why, you know, later in the video and also in future videos, it, it'll make a lot more sense once I get around to it. Um, but they're actually pretty rare. And uh, I was really happy to get this Apple IIe. It's in pretty good condition. And actually in the UK, you generally won't find the original Apple II and its success of the Plus. You tend to get the third generation machine, the Apple IIe. So anyway, yeah. At this point, I had two Apple IIs, <laughs> which is kind of funny because I never had one back in the 80s and all of a sudden I found myself with two of them. You can probably tell I was quite enthusiastic about them at this point. And then I decided to get what was actually the sort of final evolution of the Apple II range, um, which you can see here on the left here. And I believe this is an actual special edition. It actually says uh, was on the front of it. Although I have my suspicions that it's a forgery because <laughs> the name looks like uh, it's actually rubbing off. Although to be honest, I don't really know if that was actually a problem with the, um, the real uh, was edition machines anyway. Uh, this is an interesting machine because it's actually more sort of a, akin to let's say an Amiga or an ST or an Archimedes. It's a 16-bit machine, uh, but what's really cool about it is it does actually have, and this is quite bizarre, uh, a sort of an entire Apple IIe uh, secreted inside of it. So it actually has backwards compatibility with the Apple II. It's actually very much a sort of, um, it's not a virtual Apple II, it's a hardware implementation. Um, and we'll talk about that again, as I said, a little bit later in the series. Now, I'm only showing uh, three of the models here. Um, because I don't really have the room uh, in my house for more than these three models. And I don't really have the inclination either because I kind of cherry picked these because I feel that these actually represent three of the key stages of the Apple II. It'd be quite nice, I suppose, for it in terms of collecting to have an Apple II, the original model, but it's actually quite difficult to use, a little bit awkward. So in terms of um, ease of use, I'm actually really happy with these machines and they each represent sort of sort of strengths and weaknesses about the Apple II range. And um, yeah, I hope to talk about these in further videos in the series. So originally in 1977, it all started with the Apple II. This was then followed up uh, pretty soon after by the Apple II Plus. And that was a little bit like the IIe, more of a sort of iteration of the machine and evolution. It, it basically was very similar to the Apple II but it did have some sort of niceties and things built in, which made it easier to use. Then you have this machine, the Apple IIe, which came along in 1983. So one year after, I suppose, the Spectrum and the Commodore 64 were launched. Then you have the uh, Apple IIc, which is a sort of compact model. That's what the C stands for. And then later you had the Apple II GS. Now, beyond that, there were actually a couple of other machines uh, which were basically iterations on the Apple IIe. And there was also uh, an iteration on the IIc. And then towards the end of the life of the, uh, the entire range, there was a very interesting Apple II, which is a little bit like the one which is actually um, contained inside here. And that was to try and ease people from the Apple II platform into instead using Macintoshes. Anyway, let's have a look at uh, where the Apple II originated. And it actually goes back to the, the sort of halcyon early days of uh, microcomputing back in the 70s. So the Apple II, along with the Commodore PET and the Tandy TRS-80, they were one of the first microcomputers that effectively kicked off the microcomputing revolution. They were all released in 1977. Now that doesn't actually mean that they were the first microcomputers, far from it, because it was actually in, uh, I think it was 1970 that Intel released uh, the first sort of commercially available uh, microprocessor. And it took a few years before some uh, experimental uh, machines made use of that. And by 1975, you had machines such as the uh, Altair 8800, and also you had its clone, the MSI 8080. 
And you also had the SWTPC6800, which uh, used a different processor, as far as I understand it. Now, as I said, these were all released in 1935, and they were they're very much influential. But the problem with these machines was that they were not very easy to use. Uh, they basically had a very high barrier to entry. You basically had to be an expert in computing. You probably had to use a mini computer in work. And they were kind of like a mini computer, but built for the home. They didn't have a keyboard, they didn't have a screen, which meant you had to have a terminal to actually use um, these machines. And on top of that, you, as I said, you pretty much had to be an expert to use them because they were not really designed for your uh, typical new user. So yeah, really these machines were uh, kind of hobbyist machines and they weren't really suited to a sort of mass market customer. But the three machines launched in 1977, they actually changed all of this. Now, of these three machines, the PET was the first to actually be demonstrated, but it actually took a while to come to market. I think it actually went actually on sale towards the end of the year. Then you have the Apple II, and then you have the TRS-80 from Tandy. But they all had sort of similar features, which meant that they were much more acceptable to normal consumers. And that's why I say they actually kicked off the microcomputing revolution. So what were these features? Well, they had professionally produced cases, uh, well, to one degree or another. The Commodore case was a little bit rudimentary, probably you would say very angular. It sort of shows its lineage coming from a company that had previously produced calculators back in the 70s. Out of the three, I would probably say the Tandy TRS-80 was probably the most attractive machine in terms of the case, nicely produced. But that sort of made sense because Tandy were a company with a long history of actually produ producing uh, consumer goods. So they kind of had a, a head start on Apple and Commodore. And then you also had the Apple II. And this is basically the case that you can see here. Don't think it's quite as attractive, but I think the Apple II is definitely a good looking machine. I, I would have been very happy to you know, receive one of these back in the day. They also came pre-assembled, which meant that you didn't actually have to have any, any sort of technical knowledge to use them. In fact, you couldn't buy them as kits you only bought them as consumer uh, goods. And that obviously meant that they had that certain uh, appearance to the consumer, which meant, you know, people felt confident that they could go out and buy them. And uh, they weren't these scary machines, so they had to sort of hand assemble themselves. They all had integrated keyboards, which meant that you didn't have to go off and find your own keyboard. Uh, you didn't have to go off and get a, a terminal or anything like that. The PET and the TRS-80 in particular, they came with integrated monitors, which meant you didn't have to go off and get a monitor. But for the Apple II, uh, they got around this need by actually allowing you to use it with a television. And this became pretty much a sort of standard thing for home computers at the time. Most consumers didn't buy monitors for them. They would actually use it with a, color, with a television, black and white television or color television at home. So yeah, that's what made those three machines, you know, sort of palatable to the, uh, the home customer. You know, I suppose you could say almost like they were mini computers and a console all wrapped up together. That's not obviously how they work. They have integrated keyboards that talk directly to the processor, but it took that leap. Um, that idea that, you know, you didn't have uh, a terminal that was a separate device. Um, you basically integrated it all together and in the case of the TRS-80 and PET, it, they went one step further and they actually integrated the monitor as well, um, which made them, you know, appliances that you could plug in and immediately get some use out of them. And it's that which we actually think of today as a microcomputer, um, or we would probably call it today just a computer because we don't tend to talk about the size of a computer anymore. They've all got pretty small. So yeah, we don't really talk about microcomputers these days, but that's what they were talked of as historically. Now, each of these machines had their strengths and weaknesses. I'm not saying anything bad or good about the PET uh, or the TRS-80. I'm sure there are people out there that you know are fans of those machines. All I'm saying is that I think that the Apple II had some design features and technical features that went on to give it a longevity that far outshone uh, those other machines. And there are other reasons for this as well, because Tandy, for instance, they had initially very, very strong sales of the TRS-80. In fact, it way outsold uh, the Apple II. And part of that reason was cost. Uh, well, probably a big reason was cost. And also, you know, you got the integrated monitor and the keyboard was good. It was just generally an attractive machine, although I think the reliability wasn't great. But I think, to be honest, most of these machines, they weren't that reliable. That was just the sort of state of the art at the time. 
Uh, but yeah, it did have very strong sales. So you think, well, why didn't uh, the Tandy go on to be a dominant force? Well, I think it was because Tandy wasn't really a computer manufacturer when they started off. Uh, they kind of did it as an experiment. And from what I understand, they were actually shocked by how successful the TRS-80 was. And it made them a lot of money. But over the next few years, they released more machines in the TRS-80 line, but they had a tendency not to be compatible with the original TRS-80. And obviously that would have over time alienated customers. And uh, it proved to be not maybe the best machine uh, for home consumers. So over time, uh, people moved off the TRS-80 to other machines, maybe to the Apple II, maybe to the Atari 8-bit computers, the Commodore 64 and so on. Now, for Commodore, it was a slightly different sort of scenario. Commodore very quickly iterated on the Commodore PET, which was seen much more as a sort of educational and a business uh, computer. And by the early 80s, they were aiming much more for the consumer market. They found, I, I mean, the price of the Apple II was very expensive, really. And Jack Tramiel, the owner of Commodore, he wanted to aim his computers at the mass market, and which meant he had to get the price down massively. So he produced uh, a series of machines that were really cost cut, I think, from the Apple II, but which did actually in the end succeed in grabbing a lot of the, the mass market. I'm talking about a machine like the VIC-20. Now the VIC-20 didn't quite make it because I think it was really hampered by the lack of RAM. It had very little RAM and it didn't quite have that sort of magic which meant that it could uh, compete with the Apple II and uh, in, in a sort of fair fight and come off uh, the better. But a couple of years later, Commodore released the Commodore 64. And as we know, that was a very, very sweetly uh, spec machine, very good graphics for the time, very good sound, decent amount of memory. The price was bang on basically. So in America, that then uh, did very well and was a big competitor, competitor I think, to the Apple II for people who are more sort of working class. And in the UK, especially where, um, if you watch my video, one of my history videos where I talk about money, the 1980s was not a good time in the UK. We had a big recession, people were not earning a lot of money. So the price really made a big difference. And the Apple II didn't really do so well because of that. So anyway, all of that was uh, about five years after the Apple II was launched. So let's step back now to 1977. And we're gonna take a look at uh, Apple's second microcomputer, which was the era-defining Apple II. And this project was largely the brainchild of Steve Wozniak and also with the aid of his friend and fellow electronics hobbyist Steve Jobs. Now, the Apple I was literally a garage project and it was squarely aimed at others in the hobby computing field uh, basically in Silicon Valley and across the US, I suppose. Wozniak had wanted to make a microcomputer for quite a long time. And so this was a real, you know, sort of passion project for him. And I think it must have taken uh, Jobs and Wozniak uh, a little bit surprised when it was such a, a success. Yeah, the downside, of course, was that it was a kit. You bought it from them and you got a logic board and you had to get your own parts and then you soldered it together. It didn't actually have a keyboard. You had to basically source your own keyboard and uh, then obviously get your own monitor. So it wasn't exactly the kind of thing that anybody outside of the hobbyist community would uh, try and make, but it did have a distinguishing factor about it. And that was that it actually was a microcomputer in the way that we now think of them in that it didn't need a terminal. The keyboard, connected directly to the CPU and get, had you know direct input. There wasn't a terminal in between. There wasn't a serial connection between the keyboard and the computer. In other words, it wasn't a mini computer in a small form factor. Now, Steve Jobs, he was more the sort of, uh, I suppose the businessman and the entrepreneur of the two. And uh, for him, I think it was a deeply frustrating project because I think what he wanted to do was something which was a lot more accessible something that could be used by the average sort of man in the street, something that was much more sort of democratic. And I think what he had in mind was something with a, you know, a properly engineered case and, you know, with a built-in keyboard and which could be easily attached to a monitor or a TV or something like that. So together they embarked on a next generation project, which of course they named the Apple II. So the Apple II was actually then launched uh, just over a year after the original Apple I was released, which is pretty remarkable. 
and it was released for a price of $1,298, uh, which is the equivalent today of $6,690. Uh, this is in 2024. So yeah, it wasn't exactly cheap. It wasn't really a sort of impulse buy, but it's amazing how quick the turnaround was going from the Apple One, you know, this bare bones board that you had to make yourself into something that was, you know, a pretty professional product. So in truth, as I said, the Apple One project wasn't really mass market. Uh, it did make the hobbyist happy and its architecture, you know, did go on to provide a springboard for Wozniak's engineering skills so that he could then, you know, take the leap to the Apple II. To make this happen, uh, they had to then bring on new blood to the company. They brought on a guy called Rod Holt and his job was to supply uh, a completely engineered power supply, something professional, safe, etc. And they also hired Jerry Manock, and his job was to produce the case. And this is basically an evolution of the case that he designed. And at the same time, Wozniak was beavering away, working on the design and the logic of the new machine, pretty much everything else. Uh, so one of the driving goals that Wozniak had when he made the Apple II was that he wanted to actually make a machine that could allow him to write a software version of a game called Breakout. Now, Wozniak had engineered this game when he was working at Atari. Um, there's a famous story about this if you want to look it up on the internet. And he'd actually implemented Breakout completely in hardware. And this was because, you know, arcade machines in those days, they didn't really use that much software. They were mostly put together with uh, just sort of discrete logic. So yeah, Wozniak had a big success for that project, although apparently it nearly killed him. But he had a sort of soft spot for it and he decided that he was going to make sure that he could actually write Breakout in software on the Apple II. And because of this, it was clear that he couldn't use 6502 for that. Um, he could, um, but he wanted Breakout to be an example to customers that actually bought the new Apple II. So he set about writing a basic interpreter for it. Now, you may not know that these days, but basic was a language, I think it was invented in the 1960s. And the idea behind it was that it was an easy to use programming language that would act as a gateway for programmers to learn coding. Because if you go from nothing to machine code, it's a, it's a pretty uh, steep learning curve. So yeah, Steve actually went on to write uh, the machine's own basic interpreter as well, which is pretty amazing. And uh, there was one fateful decision that he made, which was that he decided to write breakout that he didn't need floating point maths. He felt that integer maths was all that he really needed. Uh, so he didn't actually bother implementing floating point mathematics in the Apple II Basic. And I have to assume that uh, Steve Jobs agreed. They had to cut the corner somewhere because you know they turned this machine around super quick. So it looks like that was one of the, um, the things that had to basically you know, go by the wayside. Now, at the same time, you know, within the coalescing Apple with its new case and its new keyboard, there sat a logic board that was, you know, a whole different level of professionalism compared to the Apple one. And I'll say it again, it's, it's quite remarkable that it took Wozniak only one year to turn around this new machine. And that includes writing its operating system, its IO, writing a basic interpreter, which is kind of crazy. However, he and the Apple team, him, Steve Jobs and the new hires, they did actually manage to do it. And the Apple II was launched at the West Coast Computer Fair in June of 1977. So let's take a quick look at what made this machine such a leap ahead at the time. Let's first take a look at all of the positive points and I'll try and focus on these in a sort of historical context. So I'm gonna talk about it in context with the machines that were around at the time, the technology at the time. So first off, uh, the machine had a full-size keyboard, as you can see at the front here. I would say it's a pretty decent keyboard I wouldn't say it's the best keyboard in the world, but at the same time, it's definitely a much better keyboard than the one that actually came with the PET, one of its main competitors at the time. Although the TRS-80's keyboard was actually pretty decent as well. Um, if you look a little ahead in the future and you look at say, for instance, the Atari 400, which had a Chiclet keyboard and also the Spectrum, which had a uh, rubbery keyboard, it's leaps and bounds ahead of those. So yeah, the keyboard was definitely a pretty solid move. It now had, as you can see here, a pretty sturdy case. And one of the defining factors of this case is that you could easily remove the lid here. So I'll show that to you. 
And um, there were various solutions for how this was done. This one has a sort of set of what I would call sort of plasticky kind of Velcro, which these parts here then clip into. Um, and yeah, you know, it's a pretty uh, sturdy piece of uh, engineering. And uh, what you find inside is the main logic board and uh, a variety of expansion cards. And uh, we'll come to that in a second. And um, what I would say about this is that it sort of exemplifies a ph philosophy that um, Wozniak had, which was that he came from a sort of um, a hobby back in the 1970s of hacking, you know, where you would take things apart and re-engineering them. And by doing that, that was how he would learn. So this lid literally invites owners of the Apple II to take the lid off, get inside and actually change the hardware and improve upon it. So yeah, you know, I think that is probably the most defining thing about the Apple II. And this is a particular form factor of uh, the Apple II, and we'll be looking at other models later on. But this case with the keyboard here and the lid that you can remove, this is sort of like what I think of as being the, you know, definitive Apple II. You know, it's a pretty cool thing what actually, you know, the guys managed to do there. And uh, one of the other defining factors, as I just mentioned, if we take the lid off again, is that you have these slots. Um, there are seven of them inside there. And um, if you come from a slightly later generation, your impression may be that, you know, a, a computer with slots in it that you can add expansions to is pretty much something that, the, you know, the IBM PC brought to the market but it didn't. As you can see, the Apple II has an amazing amount of expandability. And that stood Apple in really good stead because when the machine was launched, it was actually pretty basic. It had many features missing. And those slots got them a sort of get out of jail, you know, free card, because they could actually then release various expansions for the machine in later years. And it is remarkable because there are expansions for this machine that you really wouldn't expect to get. You know, this machine lasted a long time and going on into the 80s uh, and even 90s, you could still get expansion cards for this. And today, there's actually a really decent community still making expansion cards for this machine, which is really remarkable. I think one's actually only come out recently. There's a new sort of uh, movement at the moment to use Raspberry Pis to give you very flexible extensions. And uh, there are cards actually doing that at the moment on the Apple II. So yeah, very, very cool, the expansion cards in the machine. So uh, what else can I say about it? Well, it also had uh, another defining feature, which was its ability to display color graphics. At the time, I think the PET and the uh, TRS-80 both had monochrome graphics. Um, and I'm not sure about it, but I think also their uh, graphical ability was quite limited. I think the PET had the ability to use PETSCI, which is a type of ASCII. And I think the same kind of deal with the TRS-80. But the Apple actually has uh, full color graphics, you could say. It had six colors. I think it was black, white, blue, violet, orange, and green. It's a very limited color palette, but it did actually have color graphics. And it's actually the reason why the logo um, has a rainbow on it. Originally, the Apple logo was in monochrome for the Apple One, which is a monochrome machine as far as I know. But as soon as they managed to get uh, color working, they displayed it very proudly by changing the Apple logo uh, to this rainbow logo. And that was actually the standard Apple logo until the early 90s, as far as I recall. So yeah, if you're an older person like myself, uh, this would be what you kind of think of actually as the Apple logo instead of the monochrome one that uh, they have today. Now, the way it was achieved, um, it was a little bit hacky. Uh, Steve Wozniak being a bit of a sort of engineering genius, uh, he did a deep examination of the way the NTSC uh, color standard worked. Now, back in those days, there were different color standards for North America, uh, Europe, uh, Japan. Um, so there was NTSC PAL, I think it was CCAM as well. And he found that there was a, a very simple trick that he could do with NTSC to get color working. It was basically how NTSC uh, implemented color going from black and white uh, televisions to color. Um, and it meant he could implement color in a very, very simple way. It did come to bite him a little bit later on because when he tried to sell the machine in other parts of the world without a change to the hardware, that hack didn't basically work. So yeah, they did have to make some adaptions, but it did manage to get color working uh, very cheaply, very easily, you know, used a low amount of memory. And it was a defining 
feature of this machine, the color graphics on it. Six colors may seem, you know, pretty poor, uh, but you've got to understand that in those days it was normal for machines to be monochrome. Now, you've got to remember that Steve uh, Wozniak actually wanted to write breakout on this machine, so you can imagine how unacceptable it would have been to him to actually write breakout in monochrome. He wanted to do a colorful version of it, so um, I suppose that's why he busts the gut to get color working. So yeah, um, that's a pretty cool feature of the Apple II as well. Uh, it actually has color graphics and that stood in good stead. But of course, over time in the 80s, it became a little bit less capable in terms of color, I suppose. The processor inside it is a 6502. And this was a processor developed by Moss Technologies, something of a groundbreaking processor in the, in the 1970s. It was a uh, very cheap processor for the time, but still quite capable. And it was used in so many different machines of the era. It's like an era-defining processor. It was actually used in one of the Apple's competitors, the Commodore PET. Uh, it was also used in the Atari 8-bit computers, uh, the Commodore VIC-20. Um, I think the Commodore 64 used a sort of variation of it. Um, I think it was the 6510, um, but it was pretty similar to the 6502. A era-defining processor, which meant, I suppose, it kept the prices down. So yeah, the CPU in it was actually pretty decent. On launch, it came with 4K of RAM, which obviously is pretty laughable. But of course, at that time, it wasn't. It was actually quite capable because memory back then uh, was very, very expensive. It was probably one of the most expensive things in the machine. In fact, I think, you know, I said earlier that this machine cost, I think it was £6,000 with 4K in it. If you got it fully spec'd out, because this machine could actually be upgraded all the way to 48K from launch, if you did that, if you bought the machine at launch with 48K, it would cost you $13,000 in today's money, <laughs> which is kind of crazy, um, uh, $13,000 for 48K. But of course, you've got to think about it in context. Back then was obviously a, a large amount of memory. And to give you an idea of how much memory that was, if you bought a mini computer, um, something like a PDP-10 or something like that, it would have been more normal in those days to have something like uh, one megabyte to two megabytes of RAM. So for a microcomputer to have 48K, it was, uh, it was very, very impressive for the time. But as I said, the price meant that, you know, on launch, they couldn't actually um, put any more memory in it than that. It wasn't a big issue, big issue really, because in fact, the PET and the TRS-80 both had 4K at launch as well. Another thing I would say was a defining factor of this machine is that pretty much everything on the logic board, pretty much everything is in a socket on the logic board. So that means that it's very easy to get in here and replace any chip that has a fault. Uh, you can take the chip out easily and then obviously replace it with another one. You can take these cards out easily. It's a very highly engined machine for its time. The power supply, as I mentioned earlier, was a specific part of this project. It's a large power supply here. You can see it hopefully down the uh, right hand side. Um, so that's easy to take out. It does say on it that you shouldn't um, repair the power supply, but the reality is if you take it out, you can actually open it and go inside and repair it. Wasn't always the case with other uh, power supplies. Um, for instance, Commodore very often would pour a resin into their power supplies to make them completely non-serviceable. Um, but with this one, you actually can. You can get in there and you can fix it. Again, showing the sort of um, philosophy of uh, Wozniak, you know, that this would be a sort of hacker's machine, a machine that people could go in and change and easily repair. Now, although the machine didn't actually launch with a disk drive, in fact, it launched with uh, a data set. You had to buy a tape recorder to load up software, which was very normal, actually, in the 1980s in the UK. Over here, we were very much more strapped for cash. Uh, budgets weren't very high. And that meant that generally the microcomputing experience in the 1980s for most people uh, was using a tape recorder. Very soon after this machine was actually launched, Wozniak was set the task of creating a floppy disk drive for it. And in pretty short order, uh, he'd actually created a disk drive system called the Disk2 system, you know, to go along with the two there. It was a, an expansion card that you put in the machine, usually in, uh, I think it was slot six or something like that, somewhere around here. And then the cable would go out the back of the machine and you would plug it into the floppy drive. I think the floppy drive was pretty cheap and uh, it's pretty performant as well. And it was a, another example really of Wozniak being a bit of a, an engineering genius because he managed to produce a floppy disk for it uh, very quickly. 
really good price, good performance. And that meant that the Apple II very quickly became a machine that was really based on floppy drive use, which is very different actually to the, for instance, the Commodore 64. The Commodore 64 in its early days, which don't forget was five years in the future, was very much tape based. And it meant that it very much limited what you could do with it. Um, so from the get go, the Apple uh, II was a much more sort of professional machine, much easier to do software development on. So yeah, that was uh, a big factor in its success as well. The, you know, the disc two obviously made it a much more capable machine very quickly. As I said, it required a, an expansion card, but the fantastic thing about this machine is that it has all these slots. So, uh, you know, it's an example of how very quickly they could iterate on the basic design and, you know, get uh, new features out in this machine very, very quickly. Those are the good points about the machine. Obviously, you know, it can't, everything can't be perfect. So what are the, what are the bad points about the machine? One of the things that uh, really sucked, I suppose, at the time was that uh, they had to compromise on the ROM. I think they, they couldn't fit everything in. So they decided that a compromise was that the machine would only support one case of characters. They decided to go for uppercase. It couldn't uh, produce lowercase at all. And that was a bit of a major problem, I suppose, for business users. You know, if you're going to send a letter, you can't type it all out in caps. And that meant that it was very limited, I suppose, in its uh, market to business users at first. The PET, for instance, had uppercase and lowercase. So yeah, that was a bit of a problem, but it would be solved down the line. Another problem with it was the initial version of BASIC that I you know, discussed earlier that was now created. It could only do inter integer maths. And, and because of that, if you wanted to do, let's say, accountancy, or you wanted to do some kind of scientific calculations, anything with a lot of precision, you couldn't do it. You could only do integer-based maths, you know, which is whole numbers, you know, one and one is two and all that. So, um, you know, that was a big problem as well. You had the uppercase uh, problem, and you also had the fact that you can do accountancy. Uh, well, you could actually if you used um, assembly, but if you wanted to write some kind of accountancy software yourself in BASIC, if you wanted to write anything custom, it just wasn't suitable for that. That was a bit of a big um, issue with the machine at first as well. So later on, Apple licensed another version of BASIC uh, to get around that problem, but we'll talk about that a little bit later. It was supplied on, I think it was on tape at first. Obviously they had tape only at first. Then when the disk drive came out, they, they supplied it on floppy. And I think it was also supplied as a ROM update as well. And there was also a thing called a language card, which we'll talk about a bit later. And that also allowed you to install the, the new BASIC as well in the machine on that expansion card as well. So again, Apple managed to work out you know, ways around the machine um, having these issues. Another problem was that when the floppy disk came out, uh, it wouldn't auto boot. So I don't really think that's much of a downside because if you think about it, most machines of the era, uh, you know, the Atari 8-bit uh, machines, if you think about the Commodore 64, they don't auto boot either. You put a floppy in, they just sit there. You have to type a command and then it will actually load something. But this was something that appears to have irked uh, somebody at Apple. I'm assuming it would have been Wozniak. And uh, that was something also that was fixed by the language card. It led a little ROM tweak in it, which allowed it to actually auto boot uh, floppy disks, as long as that card was installed. Yeah, so the expansion slots in the machine, as I said earlier, were, you know, they were a real boon. But one of the things that's really a bit janky about the original model, hopefully that doesn't offend anyone, I think if I show you what I'm talking about, you'll kind of agree what I mean, is the way the expansion card cables came out the back of the machine. It didn't have sort of dedicated mounting points for the uh, cables. What ha actually happened was, you would buy an expansion card and it came with these clamps and I'll show you these. And these clamps were then fitted into these slots and the clamps were then attached to the slot itself. And then you could use the clamp to kind of hold, clamp the cable in place, which meant that basically your, your cables for your, you know, your floppy disk drive or your serial card or anything like that would just sort of hang out the back of the machine. Uh, they couldn't actually be mounted on the back. They would, as I said, they would go through the slot and then they would be clamped in place and just sort of dangle out the back of the machine. So yeah, I mean, that wasn't a very good solution. But again, that was something which eventually will be solved further down the line. So yeah, it's pretty clunky, I think that. The sound in the Apple II was very rudimentary, it has an internal speaker. It has a uh, jack on the back where you can actually plug in a speaker and it basically can produce beeps. 
if you use the CPU, you can modulate those beeps and you can actually produce sound effects and you can also produce music as well. But the problem is it requires so much CPU to do that that it doesn't actually allow you much processing to be able to do anything else. So yeah, I mean, you could produce reasonably good mono sound, but it wasn't anything special. If you think about, for instance, the Spectrum, uh, the ZX Spectrum, which again, you know, as I said, came about five years later, same thing. Um, but that was a budget machine. That was like a super budget machine. So I think probably the weakest thing about the Apple II that's actually pretty disappointing, especially as time goes on, is the very poor sound. Yeah, that was something that, you know, the Commodore 64 came along and really nailed. There we are. That was one of the things that they obviously didn't have a massive priority on when they built this machine back in 77. So yeah, I would also imagine, you know, the PET and the TRS-80 didn't have very good sound either. So that wasn't really a differentiator at the time. So again, that's probably why they didn't focus too much uh, energy on it. So when the machine was released, as I said earlier, it could only load data from tape, which was pretty rudimentary. Tape-based systems, especially when they use consumer-level uh, cassette recorders, they're not particularly reliable, they're very difficult to use. Well, they're not difficult to use, they're, they're just awkward. So I'll give you an example of what I mean by that if you've never used one. Imagine you have a piece of software and you put it on tape. Uh, you rewind the tape to the beginning, you record the piece of software. To load it up, you rewind it to the beginning, you press play, you load the software, that's fantastic. If you want to put another piece of software on the tape, you have to fast forward to the end of where the original software was. You may not know where that is, uh, so you probably have to play the tape, listen to the, the, the squealing noises, wait until it stopped, then write down on a piece of paper where that stopped, um, and then fast forward to that point, and then for another piece of software, not to overwrite the original one, press record. <laughs> you can tell just by describing it how painful it was. So yeah, a tape system for a machine of this complexity and sophistication really was um, just unacceptable. So that's why Wozniak was you know, tasked with producing the Disk 2 system which he did you know, very, very quickly. And that was done pretty quick. So that wasn't a problem for too long. Once that did come out, as I said, the auto boot feature wasn't there, but they fixed that in time. So now this machine, I don't think it'd be considered to be cheap. It's not something that the average working family could afford to buy. And you may think, well, you know, back in those days, computers were very expensive. Um, if you remember earlier, I said, is this what, $1,200? Well, in fact, the PET, and the TRS-80 were both near enough half of its price. And they were pretty capable machines. Obviously they didn't have color, but the, the PET in particular had a very good version of BASIC. It had uppercase and lowercase characters. So it was a bold move to actually price it at the, at the level they did. As I said, that's the equivalent of $6,690 today. So, you know, if you're going to paraphrase uh, Jack Tramiel, what did he say? He said something about uh, he was going to build a machine for the masses, not for the classes. And what he was talking about specifically when he said that was Apple, because Apple, I think, got a reputation for producing machines that were premium. These were machines not for the masses, but rather for the elite. And to a degree, I would say that's kind of carried on to Apple, even to the current day. Another issue with the machine was that the first run of the cases didn't have any ventilation slots. You can see here on the case, we have these slots here and here. They're quite large. They're about five millimeters wide and there's a lot of them. And the reason for that was when the machine came out, no ventilation slots at all. And what actually happened was some people, possibly because of where they lived, maybe in warmer places in the US and maybe because of cards, extra cards that they put in, the inside of the machine got incredibly hot. And in some cases, the case got so hot that it actually melted. Obviously, Apple were, I can imagine, pretty much horrified by this. And they very quickly set out to fix this issue. And the guy who actually designed the case uh, very quickly produced a new revision, which is what you can see here. I think this basically remained very, very similar from then on. It added these vents so that obviously the machine wouldn't overheat, it wouldn't melt, <laughs> and you wouldn't be working and find that you're, you know, you're looking at your monitor and it's suddenly uh, tilting to the side as, as it sort of flops downwards and uh, crushes the cards inside. So yeah, that was just something that I suppose was a learning curve for a, a new technology company. 
you know, kudos to them. They did actually fix it very quickly. And I believe once they had the new cases made, they reached out to their customers and said that you can have a new case for free. What else? Well, it's a big machine. Uh, it takes up a lot of space on your desk. Um, but at the end of the day, it's a, it's a criticism, but at the same time, it's not, I mean, it's a small criticism because in fact, if you're not going to do anything inside the machine, you can actually put a monitor on top of it if it's light enough. I know that Apple said that you shouldn't do that, but people did. And if you were careful not to actually cover up the ventilation slots, you could actually put, this is what a lot of people did, two floppy drives on top side by side, and then they would actually put a monitor on top of that. So they would create a stack like this. That was actually quite a common sight back in the day to see an Apple two, two, two floppy disk drives and a monitor on top, um, which would have been quite nice. It would actually put the monitor at, uh, you know, right on your eye line. So that's actually, so yeah, it was a big machine, but you could mitigate that because you could actually use it as a rest for your floppy drives in your, um, your monitor. So there we go, the Apple II. I think you would agree it's a fascinating machine. And we've only really looked at the first sort of stage of the whole Apple II story, and it actually goes on for uh, a remarkably long time after this point. Now in the last section, we were looking at the negative points of this machine, and I don't want you to get the wrong impression that I don't like the machine. I'm just trying to give a sort of balanced overview of the whole you know, uh, platform. You've got to bear in mind that when this machine came out, it was basically one of the first microcomputers ever produced. And because of that, it doesn't have the sort of later refinements that uh, machines had in the 80s and obviously towards the middle of the 80s and so on. So yeah, bear that in mind about the things that I've actually said about it that were a bit negative. Obviously the mistake that Apple made with the case was something that they had to take on the chin and, and learn from. Funnily enough, they did uh, repeat that mistake in the 1990s with the, uh, was it the 2000s with the G4 Cube? So yeah, sometimes people don't uh, learn from their mistakes it seems, but uh, they did actually ad address the issue. They got over issues with auto booting, getting the integer basic sorted, you know, the internal uh, slots in this machine really, really stood them in good stead because it just makes this machine so flexible. And when I come back to this machine with a specific video in the future, don't forget we're just doing an overview for now. I really want to kind of get into what the cards do and all the different cards that you can put in here. My particular machine has a few cards. It doesn't need some of the earlier cards because those were more aimed at addressing issues like the ROM card that we discussed earlier. That was there to sort of patch issues between this machine and the machines that follow to make, you know, the original Apple II sort of uh, compatible with machines that came after it. And what was amazing was they actually managed to do that. They sort of retrofitted the original machine to be pretty much as capable of the, as the Apple model that followed the Apple II Plus and this, this machine as well. You know, and I think that's really, uh, uh, fantastic. It, it shows what a great design that Wozniak actually came up with way back in um, 76, I suppose, in 77. So yeah, anyway, that is it for this video. We've had a lot to uh, absorb in this video. And what we're actually going to do in the next video, hopefully, it's going to be pretty packed, I think, um, is we're going to look at the successor to the Apple II, the Apple II Plus, which came along uh, just a couple of years later in 1979. Then we're going to look at this machine, the, the, the 2E, and then we're going to have a look at the uh, 2C, if you remember it from earlier, which is a different kind of uh, Apple II, I suppose, a sort of uh, a different shift in the architecture. And then, you know, we're then going to look at finally uh, the uh, 2GS. But we're also going to talk about the, the sort of Twilight machines that came a little bit later in, uh, in this machine's history. So yeah, hopefully you'll agree with me. It's a fantastic machine. I hope you are inspired as well to actually get one of these. Um, if you're in the US, obviously you, you would have known about these anyway, but I think over here in the UK and Australia and other parts of the world, this is a ship that mainly really sailed us by for a number of reasons as we discuss, discussed earlier. So yeah, hopefully you enjoyed this video and if you did then please uh, click on the like button and I would really love to see you come back and see the second of the two videos in this series and hopefully other videos that we produce in the future. And if you want to do that, I would love it if you could subscribe to the channel, help the channel to grow. Also think about maybe joining as a Patreon. It's an expensive thing to make these videos. Um, I've just actually bought a RetroTINK 5X to help with the video capture because I really uh, got stung on a recent video with um, a video capture. Uh, and I just think that, um, you know, you deserve better than that. Obviously that costs a lot of money. So yeah, if you can help, then you can use Kofi 
or you can actually use uh, Patreon. You can see those in the description. And it'd be great if you could, you know, if you could help out with the channel. Anyway, until the next video, hope you have a good day and take care.